Good morning. The Defense Subcommittee will come to order. Today, the subcommittee will receive testimony from the Honorable Carlos de Toro, Secretary of the Navy, Admiral Lisa Franchetti, Chief of Naval Operations, General Eric Smith, Commandant of the United States Marine Corps. Thank you all for joining us. I want to start uh, by uh, welcoming Admiral Franchetti. You have the distinction of being the first woman Chief of Naval Operations, the first woman in the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and today is your first time testifying before the committee. We're happy to have you here today. General Smith, this is also your first time testifying before our committee. Uh, you lost your chance last year, but uh, we're glad that you're back, and uh, we appreciate your your service, and uh, we were all worried about you for a while there, but God bless you, and, and uh, thank you for leading the Marine Corps, and thank you for being here. Finally, Secretary Del Toro, welcome back. It's always uh, good to, to have you. Today, our nation faces global, all the main threats. Conflict in the Middle East has sent our sailors to the Red Sea, and our strongest regional ally, Israel, is at war. The ongoing war waged by Russia and Ukraine continues to demand our attention and support. Despite these ongoing conflicts, capturing our time and resources, China remains, as you refer to it, the pacing threat. In a China scenario, the Navy is the counterstone, cornerstone of our military's ability to project power. The tyranny of distance cannot be surmounted without a robust fleet, and I'm concerned that the Navy is falling behind and is behind. The Navy continues to retire ships faster than it builds them, and I'm troubled by the Navy's request to decommission 10 ships before the end of their service life and build only six. The budget also proposes to buy fewer strike fighter aircraft than we previously planned and delays production of critical next generation platforms in all domains. I understand the need to make trade-offs, but these are pivotal years, and we must meet the challenges facing us today with credible capability. I'm especially concerned about the delays in the construction of the lead Columbia-class submarine. This program is the Navy's top priority and fundamental to our nuclear triad. Congress has funded every dollar requested for this program. Now it is delayed by at least a year, leaving no more margin for failure for the rest of the decades-long procurement and delivery schedule. I want to know how the Navy lost sight of the critical path to delivering this vital platform to the fleet, it's simply unacceptable. What's more, the budget proposes to buy only one Virginia-class submarine. Production remains at a 1.2 submarine cadence per year versus the necessary cadence of two per year, further undermining our ship count and sending a bad signal to our AUKUS allies. I hope to learn more about how the Navy will get our submarine production back on track. Following three consecutive failed or no test events in the development of a Navy hypersonic weapon, the Navy is requesting deferral of its planned procurement by two years. I'm concerned that after $4.3 billion invested in development, we have not had yet a successful test. I want to hear the Navy's plan to get a hypersonic weapon fielded to the fleet in the near term. I also want to note that my concern regarding the nearly $2 billion requested for completing ship construction that was previously funded, this is a historic level of additional funding that represents cost overruns driven by schedule delays and poor program execution. In a time of constrained budgets, this reflects the gross inefficiencies and problems in our shipbuilding program. I hope to learn more about what actions the Navy plans to implement to get these programs back on track. Uh, informed by the 45-day uh, shipbuilding program review, I understand was recently completed. I note that the Navy intends to conduct a second review of challenges in the shipbuilding enterprise and look forward to a robust discussion on the results of the review that you just concluded so we may be aware of the issues and challenges that were illuminated. The Department of the Navy's capability and capacity is further eroded by the maintenance delays that plague the fleet. The issues range from lack of experienced manpower at our public shipyards to inconsistent demand signal and government paperwork delays at the private yards. The committee continues to see the Navy spend every cent appropriated for ship maintenance, but complete fewer maintenance availabilities 
than forecasted. This creates both near-term risk to the fleet readiness and a bow wave of costly future maintenance requirements. The repeated extensions of the Bataan's recent Middle East uh, deployment and subsequent gap in the Marine Force afloat in that region, all because the Bataan's replacement was delayed in maintenance, is the latest example of the significant impacts to global operations. The conflict in Ukraine is teaching us how drones can have an asymmetric impact on the battlefield, as cheap platforms can inflict damage on multi-million dollar platforms. I'm encouraged by programs like Replicator and Hellscape that are using these lessons to scale attributable kinetic solutions to deter and ultimately defeat a cross-strait invasion by the Chinese. Our progress in leveraging emerging technologies is defined by the successes we have when we partner with the private sector. If we're to succeed in a rapidly changing threat environment, the Navy must continue to experiment with incorporating commercial technology to address our evolving operation needs. Finally, I'd like to hear General Smith's thoughts on the continued evolution of force design and how this budget advances the strategy to shape the Marine Corps of the future. Before we hear from our witnesses, I'd like to recognize the distinguished ranking member, Ms. McCollum, for any opening comments. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Secretary, Admiral General, thank you for being here today. Admiral and uh, General, as was pointed out, we welcome you to your first appearance before the committee. The Department of Navy's budget uh, uh, request reflects the enormity of your mission to defend freedom and to preserve economic prosperity and to keep the seas open and to keep them free. The $258 billion, including military construction, is the largest request we've seen. And I'd like to point out what happens in MILCON affects your ability to maintain and to deliver ships and boats on time. It's fitting that the uh, Navy and the Marine Corps work together to solve and address some of our most pressing challenges. You are at the forefront of all we do to compete with China and counter threats from Russia, Iran, and North Korea. As we know, the Navy is fighting daily in the Red Sea, defending our ships and our sailors while ensuring freedom of navigation. We thank all of our service members involved in the operations there for their service and wish them a successful mission and a safe return home when their tour is done. While the hearing today will cover a range of topics, I want to highlight a few that are important to me that often get buried under some of the other topics that the chair brought up that I also totally agree with uh, his remarks on. First, I'd like to talk about the great power competition that's expanded into a region that you've heard me talk about a lot, the Arctic. I'd like an update on our training activities in that region and the Navy force planning with respect to the Arctic. Second, the recent legislation was enacted updating the compacts of the Free Association. I feel that having this compact work successfully is vital to our success in the Indo-Pacific region. I'd like to know the Navy's interactions with our allies in that region and how this budget request supports that and if there's more that needs to be done. And finally, the committee is concerned about the recruitment and retention across the services and I'd like to hear how the Navy is addressing this. And what plans? Uh, and funding proposals are included in the FY25 budget to achieve your FY25 recruiting goals. But before I yield back, Mr. Chair, we don't get to say this very often, but I am excited and I'm here to commend the Marine Corps on achieving an unmodified audit. Thank you for doing that. You have become, yeah, you deserve a round of applause. We've been asking for, for audits forever. <laughs> So, General Smith, this, this is a tremendous achievement. You are now the North Star for how the rest of the services should be doing, getting their audits done. You've set an example, and we sincerely applaud your efforts. Uh, I want to thank, again, our witnesses for appearing today. We appreciate your testimony. We look forward to hearing the answers to your questions in a follow-up. And that with Mr. Chair, I yield back. Thank you. I'm sure the Navy's next with a clean audit. <laughs> uh, and now it's my real pleasure to uh, turn to the new chairman of the full committee and my good friend and now chairman, Tom Cole. Congratulations, uh, Mr. Chairman. 
The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, as uh, my good friend Chairman Calvert mentioned, this is your first rodeo. It's my first rodeo uh, in this spot too, but fortunately not on this committee where I've had the honor to serve, uh, thanks to my good friend Chairman Rogers for many, many years. He put me here uh, in more ways than one. So good morning to our witnesses. Thank you for being here with us today. Our adversaries continue to challenge us across multiple fronts and all domains. Now more than ever, it's critical that we maintain a strong and capable Navy. Ship count remains a significant factor of our military readiness. However, the Navy's proposed shipbuilding budget fails to grow the fleet in response to uh, China's pacing threat. Modern naval warfare relies on mass dispersion, and I'm concerned by the lack of a defined plan for growing our fleet. We cannot continue to divest ships without investing adequately in ship construction. I'm particularly troubled with the Navy's recent report finding four of our most important shipbuilding programs are years behind schedule. These programs, Columbia and Virginia-class submarines, Constellation-class frigates, and Ford-class carriers are vital to countering China in the Pacific. I look forward to hearing more about the Navy's plans to address these delays. I'm also concerned about the Navy's decision to delay several significant modernization programs, including the Navy's next-generation submarine, destroyer, and strike fighter. We must maintain technological superiority, particularly as China continues to advance its military capability. Finally, as the Marine Corps continues to modernize as part of uh, force design, I'm eager to learn more about your efforts to project power as an expeditionary force in the Indo-Pacific. It's critical that we maintain our forward posture to bolster deterrence and strengthen defense relationships with our allies and partners. I we'll look forward to hearing from you all about a range of issues that continue to face the Navy and Marine Corps today. These include fleet readiness, Navy recruitment, improving quality of life for our service members and their families, establishing stable and predictable plans uh, and for shipbuilding programs, and strengthening our defense industrial base. Thank you very much, and with that, I yield back. And again, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's, uh, that's great to say that. So great to have you on board. Um, okay, now, uh, gentlemen, you're and Admiral, your first, uh, your written testimony will be placed in the record. I'd like to please uh, have you uh, all uh, give a brief summary of your statements. Uh, Secretary Del Toro, the floor is yours. Chairman Calvert, Ranking Member McCollum, Chairman Cole, distinguished members of the committee, it is an honor to appear before you this morning to discuss the posture of the Department of the Navy. First and foremost, as you have done, I would like to thank General Smith and Admiral Franchetti for answering, again, the call of our nation time and time again. They, like all who devote their careers and in some cases sacrifice their lives in defense of their fellow Americans, represent everything that makes these United States a beacon of hope and freedom around the world. Together, our combined years of service to our country totals over a century. A century marked by multiple deployments, time away from home, and sacrifices that have been made by our families. And as we gather here this morning, thousands of our sailors, Marines, civilians, and their families are either stationed or deployed all over the globe, making the same sacrifices and enduring the same trials that myself, General Smith, and Admiral Franchetti have faced throughout our careers. In the Indo-Pacific, our Navy and Marine Corps are sailing and operating alongside our international allies and partners in support of a free and open maritime commons one where nations are secure in their access to the seas, and where their rights within their exclusive economic zones are respected and upheld. Across Europe, we, in cooperation with our NATO allies, are supporting our Ukrainian partners as they continue their fight to restore their territorial national sovereignty as Russia's illegal full-scale invasion now enters its third year. And I urge Congress to pass the National Security Supplemental in support of our Ukrainian partners as they fight to restore peace in their homeland and more importantly, perhaps, defend democracy for all free nations. And in the Middle East, our sailors and Marines have countered hundreds of missiles and drones launched by the Houthis. An Iranian partner and especially designated global terrorist group targeting merchant shipping in the warships of both the United States and our international allies and partners. We are confronting an adversary that has no respect for innocent lives of civilian merchant mariners 
and one that is actively targeting our ships, attempting to harm our sailors and Marines, because we dare, we dare to defend the defenseless. For any who may question why the American taxpayer should provide for and maintain a Navy and a Marine Corps, look at what's happening today in the Red Sea, where we are defending the free flow of international commerce in support of the economic and national security of our nation, our allies, and our partners around the globe. Members of the committee, we appear before you today to ask for your continued support, your partnership, and your commitment ensuring that the nearly 1 million sailors, Marines, and civilians of the department that we lead are ready on all fronts. While the Fiscal Responsibility Act of 2023 forces us to make very hard choices, the $257.6 billion in the President's budget request for fiscal year 25 for our department adeptly balances maintaining and modernizing the fleet of force of today against the planning of the future force while also taking care of our people, which is so critically important to all of us. This budget directly supports our department's three enduring priorities, strengthening our maritime dominance, creating a culture of warfighting excellence, and enhancing strategic partnerships around the globe. We are acquiring the most lethal, agile, and capable warships, submarines, aircraft, weapons, and systems that our world has ever seen, and they will replace the legacy systems that perhaps are, it's time to decommission. We are also funding the research and development of transformational technologies and fielding them as quickly as possible to make our fleet more lethal and persistent within our current fit up. We're also investing billions of dollars into the industrial base that supports us while encouraging them to also invest more in themselves as they should be. And as responsible stewards of taxpayer funds, we will enforce accountability to ensure our sailors and Marines have the platforms and capabilities that they need on time and on budget as well. Above all else, we are taking care of our personnel and their families by focusing on improving housing, expanding childcare capacity, and increasing access to mental health resources, amongst other critical areas. We are clear-eyed about the challenges that our nation faces today in the maritime domain, both commercial and naval. And as a maritime nation, we must confront the challenges of today and prepare for the potential conflicts of tomorrow by investing in a strong Navy and Marine Corps. Again, it is an honor to appear before you this morning, and we look forward to discussing with you how best to deliver the Navy and the Marine Corps that our nation requires. It is an honor and a privilege for me to serve as the 78th Secretary, and I am proud that our Navy and Marine Corps is the most powerful, capable, lethal, and flexible Navy and Marine Corps in the world, and we are committed to keeping it so. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Secretary. Uh, now I recognize the Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Franchetti, for her remarks. Chairman Calvert, Ranking Member McCollum, Chairman Cole, distinguished members of the committee, good morning and thank you for the opportunity to testify on the posture of the United States Navy. On behalf of the sailors, Navy civilians, and their families deployed and stationed all around the world, thank you for your leadership and your continued support in providing and maintaining the Navy the nation needs. I'd also like to thank my teammate, General Smith, for his exceptional partnership and collaboration as we guide our services under the leadership of Secretary Del Toro. Flanked by two oceans, the United States is, and always has been, a maritime nation whose security and prosperity rely on access to the sea. And for over 248 years, the United States Navy has guaranteed that access operating forward, defending our homeland, and keeping open the sea lines of communication that fuel our economy and underwrite our nation's security. The events of this past year and the actions taken by your Navy Marine Corps team in the Indo-Pacific, in the Mediterranean, in the Red Sea, and beyond underscore the enduring importance of American naval power. With an average of 110 ships and 70,000 sailors and Marines deployed on any given day, the Navy Marine Corps team is delivering power for peace, deterring potential adversaries, and standing ready to fight and win our nation's wars, if called, and deterrence fails. I could not be more proud of this Navy team. No other Navy in the world can train, deploy, and sustain such a lethal, combat-credible force that operates from the seabed to space at the scope, scale, and tempo that we do. This year's budget request supports the national defense strategy and my priorities of warfighting, warfighters, and the foundation that supports them. 
It enables the Navy to continue to meet our congressionally mandated mission, both in peace and war. It is strategy driven, maintaining our focus on the People's Republic of China as the pacing challenge and the acute threat of Russia and other persistent threats like the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, Iran, and violent extremist organizations. Given this discretionary spending caps prescribed by the Fiscal Responsibility Act and a top line increase of 0.7%, the Navy had to make tough choices, favoring near-term readiness, investing in our industrial base, and prioritizing our people while assuming risk in future capabilities. Within this fiscally constrained environment, the budget request fully funds the nation's top acquisition priority and the most survivable leg of our strategic deterrence, the Columbia-class submarine. It provides funds for six Battle Force ships and incremental funding for two Ford-class aircraft carriers in FY25 and continues our support to Marine Corps force design by maintaining 31 amphibious ships, procuring three LPDs, one LHA, and eight medium landing ships. In total, the budget request procures 57 ships across the FIDA. This budget request prioritizes warfighting by funding our operations, training, and readiness accounts. It continues our strong commitment to our warfighters and our families through pay raises for our sailors and Navy civilians and investments in quality of service initiatives such as unaccompanied housing, education, childcare, and sailor resiliency. And it invests in our foundation with funding for our installations, for our shipyard infrastructure optimization program, and for the broader defense industrial base, sending a strong signal to our industry partners on the need to increase our capacity to meet the growing demands of the present and of the future. As Chief of Naval Operations, I am committed to pulling every lever available to me to put more ready players on the field. Those are platforms that are ready to go with the right capabilities, weapons, and sustainment, and people who are ready with the right skills, tools, training, and mindset to defend our nation's security and prosperity wherever and whenever it is threatened. I thank the committee for your leadership and partnership in ensuring the world's premier warfighting force remains ready to preserve the peace, respond in crisis, and win decisively in war if called. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Admiral. I now recognize General Smith uh, to comment on the Marine Corps for his remarks. Good morning, Chairman Calvert, Ranking Member McCollum, Chairman Cole, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the opportunity to represent your Marines today. I'd like to start by sincerely thanking this committee for its enduring support and your advocacy for a timely, predictable, and sufficient budget that enables the Marine Corps to remain first to fight. I would also like to express my deep gratitude for the partnership between Admiral Franchetti and me as we lead our respective services under the leadership of Secretary Del Toro. Whether deterring, responding to crisis, or in conflict, it will be the Navy and Marine Corps Expeditionary Forces who make first contact with partners seeking help or adversaries seeking a fight. Our partnership, collaboration, and integration is a decisive advantage. Last week, I published updated guidance to the force entitled Maintain Momentum. I chose this title as I firmly believe that the Corps is on the right path under force design. <clears throat> a few points from that document. First, I believe the Corps must continue to strike a balance between high-end modernization and our commitment to persistent forward-deployed Naval Expeditionary Forces that campaign and respond to crisis globally. This effort is represented by our Marine Expeditionary Units, the crown jewel of the Marine Corps. Second, we must prioritize our operations with the Navy and its amphibious ships, and we must provide Marines with the organic mobility to rapidly maneuver from shore to shore, ship to shore, and back again. Third, on recruiting, our performance speaks for itself. We'll continue to make mission without ever diminishing our standards. Additionally, our top performing Marines are re-enlisting at record rates, and we must sustain this trend. Fourth, we must maximize the capabilities of our reserves to ensure that our nation has the ready bench of warriors that they have relied on since the founding of Marine Corps Forces Reserve in 1916. And fifth, I'm dedicated to ensuring a quality of life for our Marines that matches the high demands we place on them every day that means nutritious food, high quality and accessible gyms, and a safe, quiet place to recover from a hard day's work. Our Barracks 2030 initiative is our most consequential barracks investment ever, and it is sorely needed. While aggressively pursuing these priorities, I commit to you that our Corps will always be frugal and accountable with the resources you and the American people provide. 
I'm proud of my Marines and civilian Marines who enabled the Marine Corps to receive an unmodified audit opinion earlier this year, the first of any service to do so. They told us what we have long known. When you entrust us with the taxpayer's money, it is money well spent and fully accounted for. All these things are critical to maintaining the strength and dominance of your Marine Corps. This year marks 249 years since the founding of our Corps. That is 249 years of battles won and peace upheld in the name of democracy and prosperity for our nation and for all nations who abide by the international rules-based order. But increasingly, world events demonstrate this order is being challenged. Free trade, unrestricted access to the seas, peaceful cooperation between nations big and small are under assault. Our nation's prosperity is underwritten by a strong Navy and Marine Corps who maintain a global presence and keep malign actors at bay. Thank you again for the opportunity to represent your Marines today. I pledge to continue to work closely with each of you to ensure that your Marine Corps remains the most lethal fighting force on the planet. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Commandant. Uh, I want to make sure that each uh, member has a chance to ask questions, so we'll limit uh, this to five minutes, including myself. So when the timer turns yellow, you have one minute remaining. Uh, first, I'll recognize myself for five minutes. Uh, you've obviously heard, Mr. Secretary, that the, of our uh, problem with the number of ships that we have uh, right now and in the future of the shipbuilding program. The Navy is proposing to buy only six ships in fiscal year 2025 and decommission 10 ships before we end their planned service life. The fleet would decline to 287 ships in fiscal year 25, compared to 293 ships we have today. It's a far cry from the Navy's 30-year force structure plan of 355 ships. Meanwhile, China's Navy is projected to have 395 ships by the end of 200, uh, 2025, and 435 ships by 2030. Mr. Secretary, uh, what is your assessment of the domestic shipbuilding industrial base, including its suppliers, its capacity to handle increases in shipbuilding? Does industry need a demand signal to ramp up its production capability? Mr. Chairman, I think it's a, a valid concern, obviously, and actually the investments that's being made are starting to target the point five. Uh, we're looking at $15 billion of American taxpayer investment in the submarine industrial base. Well, as the Secretary said, we definitely need a larger Navy, and you know we continue to invest all those resources in the industrial base this year's budget to be able to set the conditions to increase that throughput to be able to meet the demands that we need. As far as the manning goes, as you know, we are about 18,000 billets short at sea right now. This is a full court press for us to be able to increase our recruiting. Uh, while we continue to maintain our very historically high retention of our sailors. So we're taking a lot of initiatives right now to reach out to every zip code in America where all of that talent is to be able to bring more people onto our Navy team. I'll just quickly say we're doing that in probably two key ways. First is improving our actual recruiting enterprise by appointing a two-star admiral to be in charge of that enterprise. 
to fully manning all of our recruiting stations and centers. By the end of May, we will be fully manned at those centers. We had taken people out of those centers to be able to man our ships at sea. So again, we're gonna have the full uh, manning so we can get out and make all those uh, investments in all of the places we get to go, in high schools and coaches and talking to all the different influencers. The other part of the recruiting equation is expanding the pool of folks that are able to join our team. We've increased the age of folks that can join uh, to be able to join up until their 42nd birthday. We've put in place a future sailor preparatory classes for academics and for physical fitness, again, to be able to provide people more opportunities to join the Navy team and increase the number of specialties that they're eligible for. Uh, we are also uh, enabling folks that don't have a, a GED or a high school diploma to be able to join the team if they have a very high AFQT score of 50, which will enable them to be in very many specialties uh, across our force. So again, we're really optimistic that the investments that we're making and the investments and changes we're making in marketing and using data analytics to make sure that we're actually getting out to the population that we want to recruit, uh, we're going to see promise and uh, progress in recruiting. So that will help us man those stations. Thank you. Ranking Member McCollum. I'm going to follow up on a little bit of the shipbuilding for a second, but what you said about um, waiving the GED and the high school diploma. So for those uh, young adults who maybe didn't pay attention, I used to teach high school. We had bright kids who didn't pay attention sometimes. Are you going to work with them so at the end of their service uh, contract that they will have either a GED or a high school diploma? Yeah, certainly. You know, we do provide a lot of educational benefits in the Navy, and we actually have a lot of senior enlisted that started out without a, a GED or a high school diploma and now have bachelor's and master's degrees. So we're committed, again, through this academic prep course as well as continuing Thank that you. support. Thank you. I just wanted to, I, just, I, I assume that, but I didn't want to just uh, do that and not have that be um, accurate so that they can take advantage of advanced uh, career opportunities. Um, after they leave the Navy. I'm gonna follow up a little more on um, some uh, questions and I'm, I'm gonna package them together and then whoever wants to respond can. Um, a little more in depth about what you feel is happening with the Columbia class uh, submarine uh, delays and what, what can the committee, and we have uh, things that we could do and discussions that we have with uh, business uh, leaders and that, uh, what more should this committee uh, maybe be looking to do to assist you in, in changing that around? Could you tell us a little more about the proposed uh, repair activities in Japan and one of our important allies? We have the Prime Minister uh, speaking to a joint uh, session tomorrow. And then, you know, how that, that could impact and free up some things in maintenance as you work through your other maintenance plan. And then last but not least, um, what is the plan for not the Coast Guard, but for the Navy to have a heavy ice cutter in its near future, not the distance future? Thank you. Thank you, Member. Let me take on the, the question of Columbia uh, specifically. So one of the most significant challenges that we have with Columbia that is specific to Columbia is actually uh, the late delivery of the turbine generator to Columbia by a subcontractor, North Grumman. Um, that has had a major impact on the delay of the Columbia. Now, there are other issues that actually transcend all of these platforms that are causing some of the delays. We have a shortage in blue collar workforce in this country that is significantly impacting our shipyards and it's making it difficult for them to actually be able to recruit uh, I believe the shipyards need to do more in terms of retaining their own people as well, too. So industry has to do a bit more, and bump it up, basically, when it comes to retaining the people that they do recruit. We have one shipyard in particular who has an extremely low retention rate. Um, and so we're trying to work with that uh, shipyard to improve their retention rate, actually by even giving bonuses to potential workers, uh, 5,000 for the first year and 5,000 if they stay at the shipyard uh, by the delivery of the first ship, for example. So we're trying to be as creative and innovative and supportive of industry as we can be, but ultimately it is the responsibility of industry to recruit and retain their own people. Um, there have been shortages in the supply chain that have been, been impacted by COVID across the board. It has also caused the late delivery of a lot of materials to these shipyards and that itself has caused problems, which 
by the way of moving forward, advanced procurement uh, for our shipyard is a strategy that makes a lot of sense, uh, whether it's for Virginia or for the aircraft carriers themselves. So those are the significant contributing factors to the delay of the Columbia uh, submarine it's, itself. With regards to Virginia, uh, it's compounded by uh, the shift from Block 4 to Block 5, for example. The Virginia payload module, module is a far more complicated uh, submarine. It's, far, it's significantly larger. And uh, the design teams, both at the shipyard, and I would argue also. Well, uh, yes, ma'am. So with regards to repair activities in Japan, we look forward to working with uh, the Japanese shipbuilders and other shipbuilders around the globe, including the Indians, for example, and the South Koreans, uh, to take a look at where, which shipyards we could actually conduct voyage repairs, because this is something that we should explore now, so that when we do, if by chance, find ourselves in times of conflict, and we have damage to our ships and repairs that have to be conducted underway, that we don't have the need to bring them back all the way back to the United States, but we can conduct these forward as we should expect to do so. And uh, Sina, so, you know, would you like to comment on the icebreaker issue? Uh, yeah, um, Ranking Member McCollum, the uh, Arctic is an incredibly strategic terrain. We know we need to operate up there. Uh, we are fully supporting the Coast Guard in their design of the, of the icebreaker and support uh, funding for the, their Department of Homeland Security for additional icebreakers. I think we have great opportunities to partner uh, with our Arctic friends like Norway, now Finland and Sweden joining NATO to find uh, opportunities to work together uh, to develop that capability broadly with uh, like-minded nations. Thank you, gentlelady. I, I want to make a point that uh, my father joined the Navy, a lot, of, a lot of young people did before he finished high school in World War II and got his GED uh, in, while he was serving in the United States Navy. So, uh, and, and he, uh, yeah, he, he did okay after he got out of the Navy. So with that, I'm happy to recognize the chairman of the full committee, Mr. Cole. Thank you very much. Again, thank all three of you for being here. Thank you very much for your service. Uh, you'll probably hear a common theme uh, in uh, what Chairman Calvert and Ranking Member McCollum had to say in my questions, because uh, I'm very concerned. I, I will tell you bluntly, I think this budget is too low. I think that's been consistently true in the administration, but I also recognize we're under the constraints of the Fiscal Responsibility Act, and that's uh, going to make it difficult for us to do some things that, that we I think we need to do. But I'm particularly uh, concerned about this shipbuilding problem. I mean, the, the trend lines in terms of the size of the Chinese Navy and ours, and they're able to concentrate a lot more of their forces in a single region than we are of ours, and we're global power. Uh, those things are concerning. Even more concerning to me is just lack of capacity. Uh, you know, we can give you a lot of money, but we clearly don't have the capacity to produce as quickly as we would like to, as much as I think we need to. So I would ask you, again, on your investments in the shipbuilding base, but I also, Mr. Secretary, would ask you to tell us a little bit. I mean, we're not building very many, pri our private shipyards don't produce commercial shipping anymore. You know, we don't have the kind of capacity. Actually, you're the biggest part of the uh, shipbuilding that we do do in the country. So we don't have the kind of base that we had in 1941 or the 1930s or well into the 50s and 60s. So how big of that challenge and what can we do to, uh, you know, increase capacity to produce? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's a great question and something I've been focused on very aggressively uh, over the past two and a half years, uh, launching this, this concept of a national maritime state graph that just doesn't look at naval shipbuilding, but looks at commercial shipbuilding, which has been devastated in this country since about the 1980s, um, after the Cold War as well, too. But we started, we stopped actually incentivizing and subsidizing the shipbuilding, commercial shipbuilding industry. And it's because of that, that actually our shipyards went from 30 down to eight uh, shipyards today that basically work with the Navy to produce Navy ships. Uh, and that's a real challenge. Uh, it also results in our ships being far more expensive than they would be if we had a robust commercial industrial base in this country as well, too. That's where we need to get after. And as part of my discoveries, for example, we've discovered authorities that are already on the books, such as Title 46, that allows the Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security and myself and the Secretary of Transportation to deem a ship that has dual military use for both commercial and uh, for military use, for example, to be able to receive subsidies. So if the ship costs, say, $100 million to build here in the United States, 
but actually cost $80, $80 million to build it overseas, we could actually subsidize that ship builder with $20 million to support the construction of that ship. We need to get innovative of how we actually grow the commercial shipbuilding industry. And I have stood up a, actually a government shipbuilding council to try to look across government for all of the key agencies to work together to try to achieve this. And there's also been increasing interest on the part of, of Congress as well too, and a request made for a maritime coordinator, for example, for the White House to be designated to take a look at all these issues to try to get us to a better place. Are there things that Congress could be and should be doing to incentivize uh, capacity building, frankly, in the non-military field. You kind of touched on that, but do you have any specific recommendations? Because that's one of the things actually looking at the tax code and some other things we could do. Yes, Mr. Chairman. I think one perfect example of that is the LNG uh, situation. And we can't build our own LNG ships. You know, if we could actually encourage domestic shipbuilders to invest in LNG, building LNG ships here, we could actually have the ships that transport LNG around the United States and the territories as well, too. And there might be, you know, international investors that are willing to, again, invest in shipyards here. You know, the South Koreans and, and the Japanese are some of the best LNG uh, shipbuilders in the world. If they could actually invest in smaller shipyards here, then we could start building our LNG ships domestically, and that would be a big boom for the economy. Great. Last question, because I don't have a lot of time, uh, and you touched on this, but uh, uh, a lot of us around this uh, room served with uh, our former colleague, our current ambassador to Japan, Ambassador uh, Emanuel. Uh, and anytime we go, he will rail at us about why aren't we doing more to use Japanese shipyards and cut the amount of time now. So, and you talked about planning it, but what would it take to actually do that? And how quickly could that be do done? And, you know, how big of an asset would that be to you and the Admiral? Yes, sir. There's a legislative proposal right now before the Congress in fiscal year 25, basically, to allow us to do up to six, um, C not CNO availabilities, but voyage repair availabilities, basically. That would allow us for approximately 15 days to 30 days to be able to bring a ship into an international shipyard and have them actually do the work. That, of course, would ease up the load on, uh, on the domestic shipyards in, in one manner. Uh, but more importantly, it will actually allow us to be able to certify these shipyards to be able to work with us so that in a time of conflict, we would actually be able to rely on these shipyards to do that type of work. And uh, it could be done on MSG ships or it could also be done on naval ships as well. Thank you very much. Yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I think we're all hearing from my, our good friend, uh, Mr. Uh, Rahm Emanuel, lately. Uh, let's see, who's next? Dutch. Me, yeah. Yep. Okay, Secretary Dutch Boyle. First thing, uh, as you know, I'm chairman of the Naval Family Board, so I work a lot with the Naval Family. Is your mic on? Of course. One, two. Uh, Can you hear me now? Yeah. All right. <laughs> okay. Um, and so we do a lot of the internal thing. We also work very closely with the Army, too. Uh, Mr. Glomax, chair of that board, by the way. Um, you know, uh, the big issue that the academy lead leadership has is increasing number of flooding events on the yard. I mean, you went to the Naval Academy, you know that, and it's getting worse and worse. And we're just fa falling behind in infrastructure, and it's getting worse. Even where the, where the, where the, uh, the, the uh, midshipmen and whatever live, uh, it's, it's, not, it's not good. And yet the Naval Academy, just last year, I'm not sure this year, was rated the number one public four-year institution in the country. And that's, so we're doing okay there. Uh, now, as you know, the Academy has put together a comprehensive installation residency plan uh, to get after the problem. And now, before it's too late, we need, to st we need to move forward. The plan includes several projects needed over the next 40 years. Um, however, I don't see any of those projects in the project pipeline for program FSRM and MILCON funding. And that really concerns me. It's, it's always, seems the Naval Academy is always left over if there is anything left over after everything else is taken care of. And we have a lot to take care of, we, as we know. Now, are there any shovel-ready resilience projects at the Academy that have been identified as a priority for FSRM and MILCON funding? Congressman, let me first thank you for your leadership on this issue and for Congressman Womack's uh, leadership uh, at West Point as well, too, because these academic institutions are the very uh, best 
in our military, and we need to be sending our best and our brightest to these institutions, and they deserve to have the, um, the material readiness of those installations to be the very best that they can be. I've been extremely devoted to this for the last two and a half years, working very closely with you. We have increased FSRM funding over the last two consecutive years to fix things like the utility bridge, and again, I thank you for your uh, investment in the seawall, for example. There are FSRM projects that are ready to go. In fact, they have a 15-year installation resiliency plan in place with numerous projects, and we could certainly make that information available to your staff uh, for additional investment as well. But we are committed. I can't speak to why my predecessors uh, did not make this a priority, but it is a priority, including the renovation of Bancroft Hall, for example, that has water leakage on the fifth floor. That roof needs to be replaced. Uh, so we're going to start the reconstruction. I mean, a lot of it. It's just the infrastructure, and it's water. I yes, know, sir. The, the, the West Point doesn't have water, but we have water, and water is getting worse. Now, we now had one major project, and, and that, that has done some as well, but uh, I, I, I'm, I'm really concerned. Um, and more broadly, how does the big Navy plan to fund and implement uh, the resilience uh, plan laid out in the long-range plan to counter the effects of rising sea levels on the campus's infrastructure and safeguard it for future generations of midshipmen and women? Well, Congressman, we're obviously extremely concerned about the rising sea levels and the impact that it has on all our naval bases on the coastlines for both the Navy and the Marine Corps. We have already made major investments at Camp Lejeune, at Paris Island, numerous other places. But last year, we need to really coordinate this as one department. And last year, I directed both the Navy and the Marine Corps and my own department, put together a 30-year infrastructure plan, and we're committed to doing that. We're about, in the planning stage, of about year 15 right now, and we're extending that out to 30 years so that we could actually have all the different installation plans for all the different bases in place, and then we can prioritize uh, with a focus on which projects are gonna actually provide the biggest return on investment to develop the combat. I always say that installation readiness is combat readiness, right. and we have to work yeah. together as and, one And I see this, but I don't see it in the budget. And that, that, that's what bothers me, and I want to get your commitment, because you've given me that commitment for the, for the two and a half years, and you've been producing. Yes, sir. To, to do this, but this is serious now, because yes. the water doesn't stop. Uh, we'd be happy to come to your staff and show you the commitments that we have made in, in, in the presidential budget for 25. But I will also add that the Fiscal Responsibility Act has actually also made it difficult for us to be able to grow that list of projects as well, too. And so in some cases, we've actually had to reduce Milcon in 25 from what it was in 24, uh, which was a very productive year to make progress on the installation front. And one quick question on uh, how, how will resilience work at the county be identified as a priority? when stacked against the Navy's range of other infrastructure requirements? It's a big question. Uh, you know, you've talked about it a lot, but it seems that the Naval Academy is always at the end. And well, for the past three and a half years, sir, you've had a Secretary of the Navy who graduated from the Naval Academy, has made more investments in infrastructure at the Naval Academy than any past Secretary probably in decades. So we are focused on this as a as an important mission requirement, basically, for the combat readiness and the training of those midshipmen. And we're also thank, thank slipping you, in the Army-Navy game, too. That, that kind of bothers well, I'm always willing to take a uh, earmark for the Army-Navy, uh, for the Navy football team, yeah. so. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. With that, uh, Mr. Rogers, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. I Chairman. Can... We I... share uh, your concerns about the advancement of China's military and, and the risk it poses to our assets in the in the uh, Indo-Pacific theater. Uh, could, Mr. Secretary, could could you quickly highlight uh, one area, especially, in which you've changed your 25 budget request to reflect the pacing challenges uh, associated with China in the Indo-Pacific? Yes, sir. Uh, of course, as you know, there are many challenges in the Pacific, but let me just highlight one, uh, and I thank the support of the Congress on this issue as well, too. Uh, when we look at the important role that the Marine Corps, and I'll ask uh, the Commandant to comment after I finish, when we look at the very important role that the Marine Corps will play in the Pacific with regards to force design, providing expeditionary advanced basing operations, stand-in forces, uh, maneuver, uh, reconnaissance and, and counter-reconnaissance, for example, they need heavy lift to transport Marines uh, into the Pacific, and then once in the theater, they're gonna also need uh, the lift necessary to do intra-theater 
transport as well too. So in the, uh, one of the things I'm most proud about is that we have three LPDs that are baked in now into the uh, fit up basically. We have one in 25, 27 and 29. And we also have the first LSM uh, that's also baked in for 26 with additional LSMs in the, in, in the fit up as well too. Um, that's one example of adjustments that we've made to be able to provide the Marine Corps in this case the ability to do their job in the Pacific and perhaps I could have the Commandant talk about that a bit more. I, I can, Mr. Secretary. Um, force design, we're committed to it. It's a balance uh, against crises, crisis response and readiness. Uh, it invests in key capabilities like strike, unmanned systems, long range fires, medium range intercept capability and it enables modernization while retaining our capacity for competition and crisis response, meaning our muse, our crown jewels. Um, the force design effort continues apace and it requires a landing ship medium, which the request for proposal is out to industry now, so I'll be mindful uh, not to get ahead of myself, but as the Secretary said, uh, the acquisition plan is the first LSM purchased in FY25, and I'm pleased with the uh, FY25 SCN plan that produces 11222. Uh, it, it, we just need a ship that meets our key performance parameters to go inter-island and to be able to beach itself and to come off a beach in order to carry these capabilities of long-range fires and sensing and making sense and passing to the joint force what the PRC is doing throughout the first island chain. Mr. Secretary, uh, let me ask you. Last year, uh, we provided funding for 79 Mark 48 torpedoes. Uh, and you've requested uh, 79 more. Is that enough? Is that too much? How uh, important is that stock of? Yes, sir. Uh, the Navy could always use more. Uh, there's no question about that. I, I think that the 79, though, that we have requested is in line with what industry can properly produce at this time. And so without creating opportunity costs in the future, I think it is the right number for now. But I think that continued investments in the submarine industrial base to be able to help increase the production of Mark 48s, in addition to um, many other missile systems as well, too, that we need in greater numbers, is the right approach in 25. I thank you. Thanks for your service to your country. Thank you, sir. Yield back. Thank you, thank, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Kilmer. Thanks, Chairman, and thanks for being with us. Um, Secretary Del Toro and Admiral Franchetti, uh, uh, as you know, our public shipyards are incredibly important for readiness, um, including Puget and my neck of the woods, uh, and thank you for, for visiting. Um, we've discussed the importance of the Shipyard Infrastructure Optimization Program, which is a multi-year, multi-billion dollar effort to modernize our shipyards. In my neck of the woods, we have been dealing both with PSYOP and with some seismic uh, challenges, which um, thankfully, you know, due to some fast action, hundreds of millions of dollars from Navy's L&M accounts were deployed uh, to repair three of the highest priority uh, dry docks. So I have a few questions on this front. First, how do we ensure that PSYOP remains on track while also addressing these seismic mitigation efforts, and is the $2.8 billion requested for fiscal year uh, 25 sufficient? Congressman, I do believe it is sufficient uh, for this year. Uh, we have made progress on the, f the multiple projects that we have across all the four public shipyards. I'm particularly pleased with the collaboration that existed between the local community and the Navy in being able to execute the seismic repairs that we had to conduct last year. It was done most professionally, most expeditiously in order to preserve the operation of that particular dry dock. Um, as you know, the dry dock programs are all phased in. Um, there will be more money that will be needed outside the fit up for PSYOP investment. There's no question in my mind about that. Uh, but I want to make sure that those projects are properly costed uh, early on so that we have a full understanding of how much resources will be needed before we actually make those requests of Congress, and perhaps I could ask the CNO to also comment. Thank you. I just wanted to add, I was just out last week in yeah. uh, Pearl Harbor Naval Shipyard, and uh, you know, it's really good to see that Pearl Harbor Naval Shipyard has learned from Portsmouth Naval Shipyard, so a lot of the lessons learned through that first uh, PSYOP project is, are actually being transferred uh, over there, and I know as we continue to design 
uh, other, the two other SIA projects, that that continued lessons learned, sharing will occur. <coughs> I think the other piece is all the new dry docks are designed to, you know, for all the seismic standards that, you know, we can anticipate. So again, yeah. I think that's already being planned in the design. Probably the big decision that needs to be made for Puget is the multi-mission dry dock. Do you have a sense of the timing? How close is the Navy to making a decision regarding the, the construction of the, the MTU-2? And you know, how will that impact programming and planning for, for the necessary work? I'll have to get back to you with specifics on that, on the, the timing. I don't want to misspeak right now. OK, all right. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask you about was uh, um, a workforce issue, the, the demand for additional child development centers with supporting staff has really exceeded the supply at installations in, in my state. Um, child care in Washington State costs on average $1,000 per kid per month. Uh, I have heard real concerns from the workers at the shipyard. Uh, you know, the combination of relatively lower wages, high cost of housing, the cost and lack of availability of child care is really creating concerns both with regard to recruitment into the shipyard workforce, but also being able to hang on to the folks that, that work there. Um, so what do we do? You know, how do we plan to assist in terms of addressing this need both for service members and for employees who are looking for something to do with their kids? And are there plans to increase CDCs nationwide? Uh, should we be looking at community partnerships? How do we handle this? Uh, Congressman, I'm aware of the difficulty actually that exists in the Pacific Northwest on this particular issue. But I'm very proud that over the course of the last year, the Navy and the Marine Corps have made enormous progress on this. Uh, the 25 budget actually has uh, four uh, CDCs in the Marine Corps and four additional CDCs in the Navy. There are also an additional 12 that are actually baked into the fit up uh, across the board. But just in the last year alone, we have gone from a combined um, shortfall of 11,000 families that have been needing seats and CDCs, basically spots and CDCs, to 3,400 in the Navy and 900 in the Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. That is enormous change. And it's also been fostered by the support that we've gotten for Congress, for example, in being able to provide families additional monies so that they could subsidize private uh, CDC uh, care as well, too. So I think we are making a marked difference from where we were just even a year ago. Uh, but we will need to continue to make more investments, particularly in the Pacific Northwest, to accommodate this challenge and this shortfall. Do you want to comment further, uh, you know? I was just going to add, in addition to the creating new spaces by Milcon or building new centers or re-renovating old ones, part of the challenge is the workforce Staffing, of yeah. the staff itself. We're about 88% manned right now, and uh, that's an improvement. Uh, from where we were, but that's about making sure that we're paying people the amount that's commensurate with what they could make out in town uh, for that same thing. So we're incentivizing them by having a discount for their own kids to be able to go to that child care, yeah. as well as providing it more, to make it more like a career path so they can have retention bonuses, they can move to different CDCs if their spouse moves to another duty station. Super. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you, Mr. Mr. Gentlemen. Uh, Mr. Womack. Thank you. have to respond to my friend Dutch's comments about no water around West Point. Obviously, you were not there on Sunday, July 9th, when a 500-year storm uh, flooded virtually that entire campus. Lots of damage. Well, that's just one storm. But, but of <laughs> note, <laughs> of note, Dutch, I have to commend the West Point leadership for doing some resiliency stuff. They have now protected the area on which the Commander-in-Chief's trophy will sit so that any future 500-year storms will not... What, what about the Scholastic number one? Scholastic table? Table. Yeah. I'm, I'm not going to yield any time to you. <laughs> uh, I also add my thanks to the panel here this morning and what terrific service you render this country. We're eternally grateful. Uh, Mr. Commandant, I'm going to jump down in the weeds uh, on, on one program with you and if I have time with, uh, with the CNO. In, I want to talk a little bit about that medium range intercept capability in the Emmerich. We've put money into that program, and I know it's a vital uh, piece of your uh, force design. And I want to give you an opportunity to talk about it uh, in the innovative strategy the Marine Corps has to implement uh, and partner with Israel uh, and bring this capability to the Corps. Well, Mr. Womack, thank you for the question. Um, we are using an Israeli Tamir missile paired with a TPS-80 Gator radar to sense and make sense of inbound threats and take actions at great ranges. 
So the, the relationship is good uh, with, with this Tamir missile. It, it fits our needs, it is light enough to be transported, and it has the range we require to protect our forces when paired with the TPS-80 Gator radar. And I can come back to you in a classified setting and tell you the, the size of the targets that the TPS-80 radar can detect. But in an unclassified setting, I can say that, uh, well, I'll be mindful in the unclassified setting, but it is an incredibly powerful radar. And the Tamir missile is an incredibly good partner to that TPS-80 radar. Yeah, and, and look, I, I appreciate the fact that you were willing to take a proven capability. And uh, to us here that sit on this committee, that's, that's very important. Admiral Franchetti, I want to ask a Tomahawk question. Uh, we all know the Tomahawk missile has demonstrated its continued utility in recent strikes against Houthi targets. I understand you expended a significant amount of Tomahawks in those strikes. Glad to see we're trying to degrade Houthi capabilities, even in a limited way. The Houthis and all of the Ar Iranian proxies are like that old schoolyard bully. Uh, they only understand strength, and, and they need to be, we, we need to punch back. Uh, I hope we see increased strikes to destroy their capability. To that end, I've noticed that while the Navy's 25 budget request includes Tomahawk modifications and research, it does not include any new production Tomahawks. Army and Marine Corps, on the other hand, are buying new production missiles. Uh, I understand the Navy does not believe it can buy any new production Tomahawks, given the Army, Marine Corps, and recertification efforts. To that end, what investments do we need to make to expand our Tomahawk capacity? Well, thank you. And again, the Tomahawk really is the premier uh, strike, land strike weapon, and uh, we continue to really be impressed by its capability. And in our budget, we actually are buying uh, new, in the FY, in the PB25, we are actually procuring about 181 new Tomahawks, as well as doing recertifications for about 1,800 of those Tomahawks. And that will also include 306 maritime strike Tomahawks. So again, we believe this is a weapon that we need to continue to invest in. I think more broadly, you know, as we talked about infrastructure investments, we also have made significant investments in things like munitions over the last few years. And we appreciate the multi-year authorities that we have to do that. And again, when you talk about what do we need to do to get after the pacing threat of China, having ready players means having munitions and enough munitions to be able to, prevent, to provide a credible uh, combat deterrent. And again, really appreciate the support for all the munitions investments, including Tomahawk. Yeah, I thank you. With 30 seconds, I'll yield back to my chairman. Thank you very much. Um, good to see you all. Um, Admiral, good to see you again. Hope you had a good trip to Hawaii, uh, Mr. Secretary. Um, let me focus a little bit on Red Hill, Mr. Secretary, if I could. Uh, we've had a momentous uh, change uh, recently from the Joint Task Force Pearl Harbor, or, or Red Hill, I should say. Uh, it is now exclusively, again, um, in the Navy's uh, Kuleana, as we say in Hawaii, jurisdiction. Um, and um, that is a, a development that we all have to be very careful about uh, because, of course, um, it was on the Navy's watch that it happened to start with. Uh, I think we would all agree the Joint Task Force Red Hill was very successful. At least that's my view, and I think it's most people's views. Um, we're now back to the Navy itself. Good, solid start, uh, but a lot of things to watch for. And one of the things that, uh, that, that has been concerning to me is that we had actually gotten Red Hill into a very focused uh, line item in our budgets, um, and that is no longer the case in the current budgets. It's now sp split up again among the various components, and so it's hard to track what's actually being put into Pearl Harbor and I suspect it's very hard to supervise as well. And that's why we went there to start with during the original um, decision to, to focus everything into one line item. How are we going to be sure uh, that your efforts on Joint Task Force Navy uh, in the next steps of Red Hill are in fact coordinated, are in fact uh, synchronized across um, numerous budget lines? Well, Congressman, first of all, let me thank you for your leadership in ensuring that uh, the Department of Defense and the Department of the Navy has the necessary funds through the supplemental that was uh, enacted uh, for us to be able to accomplish the very important mission at Red Hill. But let me also reassure you, Congressman, the Navy has never been absent from Red Hill. We have been there from the very beginning as part of the Joint Task Force, making up most of the Joint Task Force, 
and most of the leadership of the Joint Task Force, whether it be Admiral Arpolino, Admiral Paparo, uh, now Admiral Kaler, uh, Vice Admiral Wade, uh, Rear Admiral Barlett, they've all been engaged, and as have I as well too from the very beginning, and you have my strong commitment to continue to be as engaged today as I was in the very beginning to ensure that we safely take care of the service members in Hawaii and the people of Hawaii, which is our number one responsibility, to act with caution and safety always first and foremost in their mind. Uh, we have made major changes to the C2 structure at Red Hill and all our fuel depots and installations across the Navy, in fact, as a result of some of the lessons that we've learned at Red Hill. Um, the funding is sound to be able to fulfill the remaining mission there. We have 35,000 gallons of sludge that still needs to be removed from the bottom of the tanks. We need to clean the tanks, decommission the tanks, we need to disable the 10 miles of pipeline actually between the tanks and Pearl Harbor itself. And then we need to remediate uh, the ground and around Red Hill uh, in order to make it completely safe for the people of Hawaii and our service members. We are tracking every issue at Red Hill extremely cautiously from the very top of the Department of the Navy down to the lowest person who's working there at Red Hill itself and it has the ultimate attention of both the CNO, myself, and the continued leadership out at Red Hill. And I was very proud to go to and visit uh, during the transfer of authorities at Red Hill and meet with the community while I was there as well. And so the challenge continues and we will be there on the ground doing everything that we can responsibly to remediate what needs to be done at Red Hill. Um, I didn't mean to leave the Navy out of my reference to Joint Task Force Red Hill. I do commend the Navy for your actions in, in Joint Task Force Red Hill and uh, do realize that you had a leadership role. You personally um, have always been very transparent, very dedicated to this, so I, I, I didn't want to leave that, uh, that point uh, unresponded to. Yes, um, I, I get that. Um, what about my basic question, though, is how are you actually going to coordinate the budget um, um, authorities that you need? How are you going to be able to track what, who needs what and prioritize it across a number of line items again uh, as opposed to one single line item where we can track it and you can track it? No, sir. We are tracking it very closely. And, of course, the supplemental had one line item associated with it. But all the underlying activities that continued at Red Hill, Red Hill uh, still had multiple line items. And both myself, through the Assistant Secretary of the Navy, Meredith Berger, for EINE, are tracking those line items, ensuring that they're fully funded. There's not going to be any uh, withdrawal from full funding to do everything that we need to do there, uh, as well as the CNO, who's also tracking it on the uniform side as well, too, and the leadership there on the ground and Admiral Bardet as well. Okay. Thank you very much. Yes, I sir. yield back. <clears throat> Mr. Judge Carter, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome and uh, thank you very much. We've, we're, we're all concerned about the, the uh, shipbuilding with the submarines and uh, other things, but you're also starting to build frigates, is that correct? And we, you did away with all your frigates and now you're bringing back frigates. I, I chaired Milcon, I, I mean, I chaired Homeland for a while and we built what everybody told me in the National Defense Cutter, basically a frigate, uh, just outfitted for, basically was outfitted for the the uh, Coast Guard, not for the Navy. Is there anything? Do you believe, do you agree that that largest ship that they built is basically a frigate? And if so, are you looking to people that have that kind of experience that maybe they could build up the speed up the and be geared up to build frigates uh, at, in the future. Uh, the, is there any con anything that I am I just speaking out of my out of stupidity, or is that is that a reality that that ship that they built for the National Defense Cutter was basically a frigate? Uh, Congressman, if you're, if you're referring to the Constellation class frigate that we've committed to. Uh, absolutely so. It is absolutely the right decision to build that ship. My very first ship in the Navy was a Garcia-class frigate, and I will tell you that this frigate is ten times more capable than my old Garcia-class frigate was. Um, and, and so we're committed to the frigate. Uh, I think the Congress and the Navy made the right decision uh, when we actually decided to also um, uh, add additional SM-6 capability to the frigate as well, too, which will make it even that more capable as a multi-mission platform. It is what the Navy should have committed to actually 20 years ago. 
uh, we're late to the game. Uh, but moving forward, it is absolutely the right investment. General, would you like to have further comment? No, just, you know, the, the frigate really has for a long time been the workhorse of our fleet. We are really excited about getting that capability in there. Uh, you know, we have been able to work with uh, allied frigates all around the world, especially the FREM class frigate, and again, incorporating a lot of those uh, technologies that they will be building into our frigate uh, up in uh, Marinette. It's uh, very exciting to get that, that ship under, un, under construction. Thank you. G General, I got a question for you. Wait. In the Pacific, uh, we're, we're basically going to be outfitting the islands with supplies and rebuilding runways for, so that if the Marines have to come quickly to a location, they can land a plane at a, at a specific location. And I've, I've been out there once looking at this stuff, and I'll be out there again in about um, a month and a half or two months. Uh, have you ever considered using 3D printing for building runways? Uh, they can build a house in like uh, two, two days. Uh, have you ever look, looked at free 3D printing for the, the building of runways and, and low dwellings uh, on these islands where basically you don't need it till you need it? And then is the Marines going to be need to be moving both by sea and by air to respond to issues that are that are out there? Congressman, thanks for that question. We, we have considered um, the, the expanse of the Pacific and we've surveyed all of the runways and potential runways that we can use, which is why um, we've, I won't say we've, we've begun to print runways, but we've, we've begun to do additive manufacturing and digital printing of parts uh, of aircraft. And um, we have, Mo we call it Moby matting, which is a, a replaceable non-permanent runway that we can lay down. Um, the additive manufacturing is more for parts for engines, but um, the reason that we have our, our Harriers is precisely that they can land in a, in a basketball court. Um, <laughs> but we've, we have surveyed the vast amount of runways and we know where they are, and we have our mobile construction battalions uh, com along with our CBs where we can repair them quickly um, to allow our aircraft to land. So you just basically work with what you got? We do, sir. All right. Well, I'd like for you to at least look at 3D printing for various things you're doing because it's the future. Yes, sir. It really is the future as far as quick building with this very strong building, building materials. And sure. the building materials that are available on those islands fit perfectly with what they do. And they have portable units. I'm not pushing any company. I've just watched multiple companies build houses and dwellings in two days. Uh, that's pretty fast. Yes, sir, you have my commitment that we are, we are experimenting with and looking into all of those things because we need runways that are, can take a hit, be repaired quickly, and land our aircraft to include our F-18 Hornets. Thank you. Yield back. Thank you, Judge. Uh, Marcy, you're just in time. You're recognized for five minutes. I gotta remember which subcommittee I'm in. I'm sorry, I've been running around this morning. <laughs> I think the leadership now that um, um, Chairman Cole will be in charge could plan the schedule in a way that we can give proper uh, courtesy to those that come before us. That's just an observation. All right. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. The first question I have is of the Secretary. I kindly um, gave some of your staff that are accompanying you maps of the Great Lakes. And uh, I need your help uh, with some information. Uh, and looking at your recruitment numbers, both uh, for uh, the Navy and the Corps, Marine Corps, uh, I noticed they're down significantly, and I'm sure others have asked this question. But um, I'm interested in um, drawing to your attention that in some places in the country, such as the Great Lakes, where you receive many, many, many enlistments, the investments of the Navy are not very stellar. Maybe over in the Chicago area for the Great Lakes investment of the Navy, you know, fine. 
But over where I come from, when we joined Canada in the Great Lakes system, we've really been shortchanged by the Navy. I'm just being very honest. And uh, we had a big armory years ago. They, they it still sits in the, in the bay. But um, I'm just asking you to kindly look at the places in the country where you have high recruitment levels, and uh, they could be better. But maybe the Navy could do something as well. And I've been working for 10 years uh, with the Department of Defense and failed uh, to be able to bring home uh, a program like Starbase. And um, uh, the excuse we're constantly given is, well, you know, we can't bring it there because you don't have a base. We only work when you can be on base. Well, what if the Navy hasn't given us any kind of base? How do we succeed? So if we are trying to provide a pipeline, uh, help us. You don't have to answer that question. I'm just giving you a problem. And um, I'm really tired of it um, because I think that uh, our people distinguish themselves with military service. And in fact, I'm going to a big Marine Corps breakfast in about two weeks. And so those who have served the Corps couldn't find better Americans anywhere. And, uh, but I just am asking you to take a look at your assets. Over in Lorain, Ohio, which I don't any longer represent, we have uh, facilities there that could the Navy might use to speed up your shipbuilding program. All I'm asking is, look at us. What can we offer? I think the Great Lakes have been shortchanged. Maybe uh, 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 Ranking Member uh, McCollum has a different experience up in Minnesota. I don't know. But, you know, California does real well. And um, I understand that they got the Pacific Ocean, but we got another kind of ocean. And it's going to become more important with what's happening with climate change. So I just ask you to take a look at that. And um, the, the other uh, question you might be able to answer on the record, um, I represent Northwest Ohio, where one of the two commercial nuclear power plants uh, at the center of Ohio's largest public corruption scandal is located. And this plant called Davis Bessey has had a long and troubled history of safety violations under the ownership of First Energy and its subsidiaries. It's tragic, really. Back in 1986, when a series of pumps and valves failed and caused a temporary loss of coolant water to the reactor core, retired U.S. Navy Admiral Joe Williams, a uh, former commander of the U.S. Atlantic Submarine Fleet and the uh, NATO Submarine Fleet, was brought in at my request to reform the plant and its safety culture. He's the only person I've known in 41 years that did the right job there. The rest of them are corrupt. They're going to jail. Horrible things are happening in Ohio now in the federal courts uh, with the people that perpetrated these crimes. But witnessing his leadership in the aftermath of this egregious event has made me a lifelong admirer of the nuclear Navy. Uh, if only his leadership could have continued at the plant, perhaps my constituents would have been spared living through the worst nuclear safety uh, incident since Three Mile Island, when in 2002 a pineapple-sized hole was found in Davis Bessey's uh, reactor head. Given the preeminent expertise in the field, can you describe how the nuclear Navy engages with civilian power plants? If you can't do it today, provided for the record, and does it maintain relationships with such plants across our country? Congressman, I'd be happy to come back to you uh, with a submission on the record, uh, specifically how we interact. Um, however, most of the responsibilities for operating the civilian power plants, as you know, fall under the Department of Energy and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Um, but certainly, I'll give you specifics as to where uh, the intersections actually lie and perhaps what we can do to at least bring awareness of how much we actually focus on safety as the most important issue with regards to the operation of our nuclear power plants and the high standards that we impose on all our nuclear submarines and aircraft carriers as we operate them safely around the globe. Mr. Appreciate Secretary. the Secretary for getting back uh, with Ms. Kapler yes. with a written response on that. And with that, I recognize Thank Mr. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Diaz Bob. <coughs> Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman and uh, Secretary and Admiral and General. Thank you, sincerely, thank you for your service uh, to this amazing country of ours. Um, you know, the two weeks that we were not here, uh, one of the things I did is I visited a number of private shipyards. And it, it seems to me that the Navy is not fully utilizing our, our own private shipyards. And since, as we all know, since 1993, the number of public shipyard, shipyards has, has actually uh, shrank from eight to four with frankly limited uh, you know functional dry docks and 
and obviously we have the issues of delayed maintenance schedules uh, for our fleet. Uh, fortunately, that's, that's augmented by 22 private shipyards, but even there, uh, three shipyards have left the industry and only one new shipyard, I think, has been built since, uh, I guess, since the 60s, right? Since 1960. And so, it, 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 would, it would seem to me that uh, since we're falling behind in maintenance, what is it now? We're looking at 20 years behind maintenance, right? Uh, something like that. I mean, I whatever, whatever it is. I wouldn't agree with that number, but okay, we well, are. Yeah, and it would be great to get the actual number, not right now, but, but just where we are. But I think there's pretty much an agreement that we're, we're not where we need to be, right? Um, and so I'm just uh, curious, why are we, or, or am I wrong, that we're not fully using our own, you know, private <coughs> Uh, shipyards. Um, we keep hearing about the industrial base, obviously, which is a real issue. Um, but but I think there's some inconsistency in how we're using them. I, I actually witnessed some some um, you know open areas there that are, that that they're kind of waiting for a ship to, to to come in, and so the the there seems to be some inconsistency potentially in scheduling. So just if you could help me kind of understand uh, what, how can we do a better job utilizing those shipyards? Yes, Congressman. Uh, first, let me say we are maximizing the use of our private uh, shipyards. Uh, there may be smaller shipyards that perhaps have not been able to successfully compete for contracts, and we'd be more than happy to work with your office to identify any, for example, in Florida who may have had challenges in competing for smaller shipyard contracts. Uh, obviously, all shipyards are not capable sure. or certified to work on nuclear submarines and aircraft carriers, and this is part of the problem. We want to help as many small and medium-sized shipyards to become certified to be able to work as subcontractors to the major primes so that they can more fully engage in doing the shipyard work itself. But just in the President's budget for 25, we have $14 billion that have been invested in maintenance across these shipyards, and we have 57 actual availability, excuse me, 58 availabilities uh, for private shipyards, both for submarine work and sur sur surface craft work, large and small. So we are making maximum advantage of the capacity of our shipyards. But again, as the Secretary of the Navy, my job is to keep ships, ships at sea, not to ha have them in shipyards all the time either. And so I want to be able to minimize the amount of time that they actually are in shipyards by making those shipyards as efficient as humanly possible. And that's part of the submarine investment in the industrial base of $14 billion over the next five years and $750 million on the, uh, on the surface ship side. So we are perfectly willing to work with your office, Congressman, if there are shipyards in Florida or other shipyards that you may be uh, aware of, including Bartlett in Ohio, Congresswoman. Uh, I'm more than happy to work with Bartlett to have them be more effective in actually integrating into the supply chain for all the shipyards. Uh, to get them to a better place. And I have been actively going around the country visiting shipyards in Mare Island and in Philadelphia and all across the country. So I'm willing to continue those efforts to integrate even more into our supply chain. Great. Great. If I, I have a minute left, I, let me just follow up with what with the dean of the House asked about torpedoes and you answered. Um, and I, I believe, Mr. Secretary, you talked about that's that's what we can do now with the current capability out there, right? Is there anything that we can do to increase that capability of, uh, to, to, uh, to increase our capability to build torpedoes? It, it would seem to me, obviously, that if we're dealing with an issue in the Indo Pacific, uh, we're going to need some large numbers, right? And anything that we need to be doing on our side uh, to increase that capability of manufacturing, of building, of, of producing torpedoes? Well, continued investment in supply chain is always welcome. I mean, I fully understand that, again, we're restricted by the Fiscal Responsibility Act this year in terms of the, cho the choices that we can make, but additional investments on the civilian side into those companies is always welcome. Perhaps uh, CNO could comment further on the torpedo issue. In, again, I think it's uh, for the suppliers and the supplier base, it's really about increasing the, the throughput. So again, you know, it takes a long time to make a torpedo. How can we make them more quickly, more effectively, and uh, that will help us get more munitions that we need uh, out there into our units. And Mr. Chairman, I apologize for going eight seconds over my time. I yield back. We'll forgive you. Mr. Garcia. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for your service to uh, this beautiful country. Um, I, I personally have no doubt that we would win a war against China. I think it would be protracted, very bloody, uh, extended, probably not popular after time. 
but I do believe that because of the Marines with the rifles and the sailors who launch uh, and, and project power overseas from carriers and vertical launch tubes that we would win that war. Um, what I do have concerns about is our ability to deter that war. Uh, and, and frankly, the pivot to the Pacific has not been fully realized. Uh, and I think that's, uh, uh, by any metric that you look at, a reality. We are either falling behind or losing our lead relative to China. Um, the, 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 the most important weapon system, in my opinion, and frankly did not get enough attention today, is that young Marine, that young sailor, the young Army soldier, the junior enlisted E1 through E6. In California, they just raised the minimum wage to $20 an hour last week, okay? So that means that a McDonald's worker right now, a starting salary is making almost double what an E1 makes when they join the Navy. Now, that doesn't account for housing, BAH, BAS, and all these things, but those incentives are also lagging, right? BAH in San Diego is, is not keeping up with the pace of home value. So I would encourage you to, to you, you've got on the President's budget request a 4.5% increase in base pay. I would encourage you to look at my RAISE Act, which takes the f starting salary of an E1 from 22,000 and, and brings it up to $31,000, which at least gets it to that $15 equivalent per hour, okay? Um, it compresses the pay table so that doesn't ripple all the way up. Generally, you're not gonna get that kind of a raise, but uh, the E1s and e through E6s deserve that raise to get above the poverty line, to get off of food stamps. Uh, the request is that you support that, uh, and we were, are gonna try to work that through Congress. The other request I have is that you continue to uh, remind the young Marines and sailors that the military spouse licensing re relief law is now the law of the land. Uh, spouses who have a professional license should be able to get reciprocity across state lines. As I visit units, um, they don't know that. Um, so we need to do a better job making sure that the, our, soldier, our, our troops know that um, the spouses should be able to just cross deck their licenses across state lines if they're a real estate agent, nurse, doctor, teacher, whatever it is. Um, a lot of talk today about ship building. Uh, I am more concerned about ship readiness in the fleet. And, and Sec Secretary, you, you mentioned, you know, getting as many ships to sea as we can. That's the, that's the metric you look at. Um, as my classmates uh, start becoming one and two star admirals, they start becoming skippers of amphibs and aircraft carriers. I'm hearing stories that are frankly just blowing my mind. And we visited Seventh Fleet, what, last year and the Seventh Fleet Commander was talking about cannibalizing cruisers to make destroyers whole or vice versa, and um, the, the metrics are bad. Um, so we're gonna submit a series of questions for the record that, that I'd like to get a better understanding of what our re re true readiness issues are, uh, spe spe specifically in the Indo-PACOM region, specifically around Japan and Seventh Fleet. Um, in the, in, in the aviation community, we use the FMC versus, you know, partial mission, full mission capability versus partial mission. I, I think the metrics are not just bad, but I also think that the metrics are not truly honest. And I'm not accusing anyone of gun decking their, their, their logs here, but our readiness levels when it comes to the ship availability numbers is below where it needs to be. So we're gonna submit some uh, information uh, or so, some questions for the record for that. Um, the repair issue, sec Secretary, I agree. We, we, I, the only thing I disagree with you is that the, 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 over, the all overseas ship repair capabilities and the partnerships with other countries should not begin today. It should have begun 10 years ago, to be honest. We need to lower the classifications and sensitivity levels of some of these, re these repairs. I know that's not your fault, but we need to accelerate that uh, and make sure that we are, we are doing that uh, mindfully. Um, the, the, uh, so just to sum up, a couple last support for higher pay for junior enlisted, especially the RAISE Act. We're gonna be continuing to fight that fight. That was in the uh, Hack D bill last year. The Senate stripped it out, and unfortunately it didn't come to the floor in the end on the final version. Uh, we have uh, a lot of metrics that we're falling behind in, and, and recruitment is, is probably one of the, the most scary uh, metrics that we were falling behind on. Uh, if I can ask a question here, uh, Sec Mr. Secretary, what's the status of the strike fighter shortfall? This has been a well-documented issue. I thank you for finally getting the prime on contract for the Hornets. We lost three as a result of all that churn. Uh, the American taxpayers are now getting 17 instead of 20, but uh, if you can comment on the status of the strike fighter shortfall uh, and what are the plans to mitigate that uh, moving forward. Yes, Congressman. Well, covered a lot of ground. I'm not sure I can answer it all in 635, but I certainly would. Love I'll submit the, the, all of the others, uh, QFRs, and just the strike fighter shortfall. Okay.
We can get back to some of the written responses to the gentleman. That would be great. Um, and again, uh, we appreciate getting those 17 hornets under contract finally. Yes, sir. And by the way, there's a huge advantage. Um, <coughs> forgive me, my mic was on. There's a huge advantage, actually, because, well, the big success to the Boeing negotiation, and I'm thankful to Boeing for having finally closed the deal with us, is the advantage that we get from the, from the data package, actually. Uh, which is enormous, uh, protecting the, getting the intellectual property rights uh, to those jets so that we can actually conduct uh, emergency repairs on them in the future should it be forward is a huge, huge advantage. And, and that's the big return on investment that the taxpayer is getting out of this as well too. And hopefully it will also serve as an example for future negotiations on MQ-25, which will be extremely important moving forward. Mr. Aguilar, you're recognized. Thank you, Chairman Calvert. Um, Apologies for stepping away. I, I had a press conference to attend, and the first question I, I got was about Mr. Cole. Um, so uh, I wanted to. Uh, I said some nice things in the spirit of our of our committee. I said some very very nice things uh, about our colleague, Mr. Cole. Congratulations uh, to you. Uh, we all look forward to to working with you uh, and your leadership uh, here as well. Working with uh, Chairman Calvert and uh, Ranking Members McCollum and Deloro. Uh, Mr. Secretary. Uh, I wanted to start where, where you started, which is the National Security Supplemental. Um, we know included $3.4 billion uh, to support the submarine industrial base. Uh, what, what happens, what's the impact if this, if this doesn't pass? Um, and uh, can you talk to me about how the funding would affect uh, specifically our AUKUS uh, relationship uh, and those commitments? Thank you, Congressman. <coughs> our goal is to get our, our goal is to get to 2.3 on Virginia-class submarines as just one example. And so these submarine industrial-based investments are critical in order to help uh, the industry uh, get there uh, with, under our oversight. So if we don't get the $3.3 billion in additional supplemental money, that means that we will have to actually slow down the workforce training programs, the advanced manufacturing uh, programs that we hope to implement over the course of the next year or so. Uh, and it will simply slow the process of us being able to get there. And that's why it's so critically important to have this supplemental pass in Congress. Uh, in addition to the support that we need to provide, the $60 billion or so that we need to provide our Ukrainian brothers and sisters who are fighting for our freedom in Ukraine. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. A critical component that we've spent some time here, and I appreciate the conversation talking about recruiting uh, and retaining a uh, skilled workforce. Uh, Admiral, I did want to ask you if you have anything to, to offer on the National Security Supplemental, please feel free, but specific to uh, the Additive Manufacturing Center for Excellence, um, you know, are we beginning to see the results of these efforts? Um, what's the retention level of those uh, recruited? Uh, what's the, the future of that, um, you know, look like as well? Thank you. And just on the supplemental, you know, it's really important to maintain the momentum. So, you know, we've made investments over the last couple of years. This continues that momentum. And again, it's take a little bit of time for these investments really to percolate through the system to be able to have the effects we're trying to achieve uh, to increase the throughput, both in the submarine industrial base and, as the Secretary mentioned earlier, in our ship building industrial base for surface ships. Um, on, the, on the Danville Center, you know, this is one of the, the many initiatives that we have working with industry to create a pipeline. Uh, you know, for the workforce to be able to, to come from wherever they are, enter one of these training programs that's, you know, it's a state uh, industry Navy partnership to be able to come out with a certification and a direct path into a, into a job. So we're really excited about uh, both of these pathways as well as the, a, the promise of additive manufacturing and the different opportunities that it's going to give us going forward. So again, these investments really help, I think, uplift the entire workforce that will be able to help us in any one of our shipyards going forward. Can you talk about um, other partnerships that, that uh, we should know about, um, uh, specifically uh, as it involves our, our universities and existing um, uh, you know, institutions and, uh, uh, that, that you guys are working through and that you think could yield some benefit? I think we have a, a lot of good relationships with different academia through uh, different laboratories that we use. I would even say some that you might not think about, which is partnering on uh, getting out into the high schools and into uh, middle schools with STEM. Um, because again, if we really want to grow our workforce, our engineering designers that we need in the future, there are different uh, programs. RoboSub is a great example of one of those, you know, where really getting kids interested uh, early on. 
uh, in technology and really introducing themselves to the Navy, to academia, and then really engineering and design. So I think beyond just the ones that we're doing with industry and with state to produce the workforce we need at the more senior level, I think these are some good opportunities. There's also a lot of partnering going on with community colleges. And again, this is another place, not just for recruiting, uh, but for training the workforce we need in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Admiral. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, Mr. Elzey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm very honored and grateful to be on this subcommittee. And as a former Navy pilot with my friend Mike Garcia, uh, I'm grateful that we're starting these budget hearings with the best service. <laughs> I appreciate the three of you being here, but I'd also like to point out someone who I've known since 1988, who I knew was destined for greatness, and when she was my upperclassman at the academy, I don't remember too many of them, but I remember her, and I'm really proud of her, and I'm proud to see her here, and that's uh, Major General Shea. Uh, she is, uh, she is a, a great person and a great leader, and I'm really, really glad to see you again. It's your fault. <laughs> you can, from the top rope. Bases, boats, barracks, and airplanes. This service, unlike most of them, has to leverage all of those four things with the current requirements plus future requirements in a way that no other service has to. They really don't. And in, at some point, with limited abilities to pay for that stuff, something gets leveraged every once in a while, which is why we're seeing what's going on with our bases and our barracks as compared to our, our Air Force brethren that are just falling apart because we have to build new ships. We have to... Uh, go fight at war. Every time we're on deployment, we're on a wartime footing in, in the sea service. Uh, and you're forced to think about EW capabilities that we may or may not have, but we need. Uh, contested logistics that we're, we're dealing with from time to time and is going to be looming in, in the Indo-PACOM. Tanking, which suddenly rears its ugly head with new scenarios. Magazine capacity issues. Construction of missiles, which aren't airplanes, but everything that we shoot off of our, our aircraft or drop off of. Now with the Chinese capacity to outbuild us 10 to 1, those are issues that we always have concern. And admittedly on our side, CRs, not passing the budgets that you've asked for, uh, the FRA, and mandatory spending, which has eaten up more and more of our capacity over time. But you mentioned something, SECNAV, about the competition for your blue collar workers. So what we have with the, with the sh shipbuilding and the industry versus what you're doing is the two in uniform are competing for the very same people that we need for that industrial complex. And when we're talking about uh, where are we getting these folks, when the number one killer of Americans at wartime numbers, similar to World War II, is fentanyl killing 200 Americans age 18 to 49 every day, that pool is getting thinner and thinner and thinner. So we have to find other ways to build that industrial base that may not be based on ours. And uh, the two in uniform are in competition with police, law enforcement, welders, plumbers, trades all across the country, and suddenly we find ourselves at a crisis of manpower capabilities for the blue collar trades in our country. So it's a difficult problem to over, you can't buy yourself new people. Um, Secretary De Toro, I appreciate your frank dialogue on, on the industry and how to improve delivery in our shortfalls. CNO, thank you for the opportunity to join you and Mr. Case on ISEX. Um, it's a once-in-a-lifetime trip that I never intend to take again, but it was fantastic. <laughs> I also want to commend you on getting more players on the field for autonomous platforms. And, General, your work on the Marine Corps transformation is commendable. And even if you don't believe the warnings coming out of Indo-PACOM, one only needs to look at Europe and the Middle East to see that we need to be approaching our defense needs through an immediate wartime lens because we are at war in the Red Sea with the Houthis. The Philippines is at war with China. Uh, we are at war with the cartels, and that must mean we must properly fund our force structure and deliver ships and aircraft on time and on budget. We also need to accelerate the fielding of new technology. Uh, on that front, it's good to see the Navy advancing the work of Disruptive Capabilities Office, and that is a game changer. Uh, Admiral, in the short time I've got left, because I tended to talk too much, uh, are you pleased with the resupply in the Red Sea, and are there some needs that have manifested themselves in a way uh, that we didn't foresee? Very quickly, please. Thank you, and I'm really proud of our team operating in the Red Sea. It's really years of investment that uh, we have the equipment that is operating as it's designed. We have the people that are trained and ready to use it. I think on the capabilities that we think about for logistics and contested logistics in that theater and other theaters, I'm really pleased with our logistics force is being able to deliver. We had been developing some expeditionary reload capabilities as well, and we've been able to put those in practice. 
and again, a lot of lessons that we can take uh, to use in other theaters going forward. Thank you, Admiral. General, I'm, I'm about out of time, but I did want to talk about contested logistics, and I'll, I'll get those questions on the record. I didn't want to ignore you today, but I, I ran out of time. So contested logistics and aerial refueling capability in the Navy are, are questions I'd like to see answered. I'll submit those for the record, and thank you all for being here. I yield back. Thank you, gentlemen. I just have a, some last comments, and I'm turning it over to the ranking member, and we'll, we'll uh, close it up. But uh, one, one thing, uh, Mr. Secretary, and as you know, I, I've been talking about innovation for some time now, and uh, certainly a high priority for me when, since I've come to Congress, and for, for both of us, obviously. And I, um, I think it's a collaborative effort uh, on innovation across the services, certainly across the enterprise. And uh, DIU uh, right now is scaling manpower to support increased appropriations in FY24 and going forward. Uh, Secretary, I'd, I would like to get your commitment. You'll support the DIU with the manpower billets and detailees as needed before we can uh, get this program off to a robust start. Mr. Chairman, absolutely. I mean, we, we are re really uh, tied closely to, to DIU. In fact, uh, when Replicator came out, we're probably one of the biggest contributors to the Replicator program with funding provided by DIU as well, too. Uh, so our disruptive capability office is simply working side by side with DIU. Yeah, I'm hopeful that they don't use the DIU money that we just appropriated as a pay for uh, for all of this, but I'd like to find some other avenues to uh, to pay for that if we move forward on reprogramming. Uh, uh, with that, uh, Ms. McCullum. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, we have a robust discussion in, in the office, and Mr. Garcia uh, rightly points up the competition for pay. But I would like um, uh, for uh, you, Admiral, and General, to kind of touch on, you've, you've been successful with, with recruitment, but it's not, it's the barracks, it's the daycare, it's the health care, it's everything that we also have to account in our budget when we go to balance it at the end of the day. So recognizing we've done bonuses, we, we need to do more. Could you maybe elaborate what you're hearing and what's keeping with recruitment and how we have to keep moving forward in making <coughs> advances and making sure the funding's there for those other things that are touching those sailors and Marines' lives that's making them stay? If you could just take a minute and, and do that as you did in my office, I'd appreciate it. Well, thank you. I mean, I think, you know, our most important resource is our people. Uh, we can have great platforms, we can have all the good equipment, but if we don't have the people that can operate that, I think they're really our true secret weapon. And we really have to invest in their quality of service. And you know, we've been very focused on making sure that we are a world-class employer, that we can attract and retain uh, those people that, be, that will do that war fighting for us. You know, we have uh, focused on improving our barracks, uh, making sure they have a high quality of standard of living. Uh, we are working hard to improve 24-hour access to gyms, uh, making sure that people have access to parking, making sure that we can put our mental health care providers, uh, make them embedded with our units so people can quickly and easily access uh, some of that health care that they uh, need at their time of need. Uh, we are also working to make sure they have access to high-quality food. We've just changed our policies so they can cook food in their rooms in the barracks. Again, that is something that is very meaningful for the younger generation being able to take care of themselves. And again, we want them to be able to have that standard of living. I think for our families, of course, we're focused, as I mentioned earlier, on childcare and making sure access to childcare. And again, I think the other thing we were looking hard at is quality of life while ships are in shipyards. Uh, making sure that our sailors have an opportunity to serve at sea, that they don't spend their entire first enlistment uh, while they are in a shipyard, in the shipyard, that they get off and do what they join the Navy to do, and also that they don't have to live on the ship when they're in an availability. So those are just some of the things uh, that we're looking at. I would also, last one I would say is younger people really uh, love to have Wi-Fi, access to Wi-Fi, setting up a lot of pilots so we can uh, make sure that people have access to free Wi-Fi and things that they need to get their jobs done and their life taken care of. Uh, thank you for your testimony, and Mr. Garcia, but we'll, we'll figure out a way to balance all this out. I know we will. Thank you. Uh, thank you, and uh, before we conclude, I'd like to thank our witnesses, uh, Mr. Secretary, as always. I appreciate your frankness in coming uh, to meet with us in this committee. Uh, CNO, uh, thank you again for your service, and uh, Commandant, 
we appreciate all of you. We appreciate your service. Uh, if there's any questions for the that would like to be submitted, I would encourage the members to do so. Uh, and please respond in a reasonable amount of time. And with that, the committee stands adjourned. <laughs>